Welcome everybody. Welcome to our four o'clock webinar on how to get involved in the Bats in Churches project. We've got webinars themed around land and nature all this week at lunchtime and four o'clock every day, Monday to Friday, because this week is Churches Count on Nature um, as part of the beautiful burial ground week. So all around the country, we've got about 240 churches that have registered to say that this week they are taking part in a, a Churches Count on Nature event. So there are people out in their churchyards recording the plants and insects and trees and birds that they see uh, and making those records of the precious ecology in our churchyards. And meantime, we're running the national webinar program with a whole series of topics on land and nature. And this afternoon, we are talking about bats. Uh, these are the upcoming attractions this week. So we're on the one that's highlighted, uh, but there's more sessions to come. Please do register. I'll put the link in the chat when I have finished. If you want to know about the land section of Eco, Eco Church or how to find our faith in trees, a really interesting session on how the church commissioners look after their rural portfolio of land for climate and nature, a uh, session on blooming and beautiful, the very precious flower rich churchyards that we have, uh, the Nature Recovery Network, and that one's featuring Tony Juniper from Natural England. Then we've got a session on how to use church spaces for growing food and growing mission, a really useful one on urban hope. So if you're from an urban parish and you've only got a very small space what can you do with that small space and then we're ending with a, a big picture webinar from global to local tackling the joint crises of biodiversity loss and climate change please do come along to as many of those as you are able there's then two more sessions we've got planned so far uh, back on the topic of net zero carbon where I spend most of my time. Uh, one is in the middle of June on the faculty rule changes that were enacted by General Synod in February and come into effect in July. And then one in September on how parish buying in two by two can help parishes through central procurement on things like solar panels and heating, EV car charging, energy audits and the like. So back on to today's topic, uh, we will be using the Q&A for your questions rather than the chat. So please do find the Q&A. That's where to put your questions. That's where to vote for other people's questions using the thumbs up. After today, I will send you Claire's slides and any links that are shared in the chat. And I'm recording all of the webinars and they will be shared through our website. Uh, it will take me a few days given that we've got 10 webinars, but they will appear on our website. Right, most importantly, you're here to hear from Claire. Claire Boothby is the Training and Survey Officer for the Bats in Churches Project and will be telling you all about what that means and how to get involved. I'll just stop sharing my slides so that Claire can share hers and lead us away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's just share my screen. Okay, so um, can everyone see that okay? Looks good to me. Good, fantastic. Uh, so hi everyone, thank you. Um, it's great to be here as part of Church's Count on Nature. So thank, thank you, Catherine, for inviting me to, to speak here. Um, and it's great that, um, that there's quite a few of us that are here to talk about bats in churches as well. So um, as Catherine said, I am the training and survey officer for the Bats in Churches project. Um, the Bats and Churches project is a five-year partnership project. It started in 2019, so we're actually coming into the, the final phases of it, really. So we're in the fourth year. Um, it's mostly funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, and it brings together partners across the heritage and conservation sectors. And our aim is to find solutions uh, to help churches that are, um, that are living with, with bats and find ways to help the bats and the people live more harmoniously together. So um, one of the key aspects of the project, of which there are quite a few, is about um, going into different churches across England. Um, we're asking people to visit a local church across England um, and look for evidence of bats. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about um, mostly um, today, actually. So this, uh, this is what we call the Bats and Churches Study. 
um, and this is the final survey season and it takes place this summer and it goes on until the end of August. So there's still, um, there's still quite a bit of time to take part. Um, and the first part of this talk will really be looking at what are these surveys, what's involved and what we found so far. Um, and then we'll move to exploring um, how to look for evidence of bats in churches, what you're looking for and where to look. Before I go on to this though, I don't want to assume that anyone's heard of the Bats and Churches project before. And there's a lot of work that we're doing and we're working very closely with just over a hundred churches. And I wanted to quickly share a video which kind of encapsulates some of this, some of this work. We love conservation, we love the environment and conservation and looking after God's world. It's living with the effects of having some of the conservation within the building. It's not like having them in your loft at home, for example. It's more like having them in your dining room. Rather than looking at it as destructive, there's a lot of negative interaction. In other words, when the bats are roosting, there'll be droppings falling out of the roost onto the floor. So somebody's got to come in and do a lot of cleaning before all these events take place. Particularly for those who have the role of being volunteer cleaners, it's, it's disheartening. They can come in and clean and spend two or three hours cleaning and then they go home and within a couple of hours, it's as if they'd never been here. They don't want to get rid of the bats, they just want to reduce the burden the bats are placing on them and the church so that they can carry on the functions of the church. So a lot of my challenge is about how to try and solve that, how to accommodate both the needs of the people whilst also bats. The reason that bats like buildings like this is it's the closest they can get probably to ancient woodland. And what you've got here is a tall enclosed place like a woodland ride with nice wooden structures up at the top like the tops of trees where they can find roosts so it's an ideal place for them so last year we did uh, four surveys here uh, dawn and dusk in fact i actually slept here the night between the surveys which was lovely i slept i think where we're sitting now but what it meant is we could watch the bats behavior from the bats would come out of a beam at the top of the, the roof uh, they'll fly around inside the church, circling around before they gather at the chancel and exit the building through the uh, uh, small gap in the stained glass window. They'll then fly off and forage. They might come back occasionally during the night, so you've got regular bats coming in and out. But the bulk of the activity is at dusk. And then at dawn, they tend to gather outside the church, outside the stained glass window where there's a hole. Um, they'll, again, socialise, chattering away before entering inside the church. It was a very interesting case, this, because it was important for the ecologist, Chris, to find out how bats were using the church. And he then came forward with proposals, one to filter the bats coming into the church into a new bat box inside the chancel. Now, that was going to be quite obvious, and therefore the architect um, designed a, a new hatchment effectively a modern hatchment to cover the bat box and make it seem fitting and appropriate within the church so once to a new external access point to where they're roosting we can look at potentially creating a new roosting point around the bat access which is how we arrived at creating a a rather charming bespoke bat box with a heraldic shields on it that honour some of the historical families associated with the church. I think what we're looking at now is a longer term relationship between the back group and hopefully quite a few church communities, not just in Willington, but in other places as well. So we've got the bats and our responsibility to them. We've got the building and our responsibility as stewards of a beautiful historic building. And we've also got the living community, the church, the people who meet here week in, week out, um, and the people from the village for whom this is their church. And now with the introduction of the Bats in Churches class licenses, all three of those have an equal voice. Okay, so I um, just wanted to share that just to give a flavour of um, some of the work that we're doing with our kind of our project churches that we're working very closely with. And if you want some more information about those, um, we do have quite a bit on our website. 
Um, but for the rest of this, I'm going to be talking about um, how we're uh, how the project is getting kind of a larger impression of that's use of churches across England, um, and it involves a lot more churches. Um, so with the surveys that we're carrying out, we want to understand a number of things. So the first one, and it sounds like it's a quite simple thing, how many churches house bats? Actually, that's quite a difficult question to answer, but it is one that will be actually very useful. <laughs> so um, Bat Conservation Trust did some work in the 90s, um, and it suggested that the older churches the pre 16th century churches were more likely to house bats. Um, and they uh, suggested that at least 60% of our um, pre 16th century churches housed bat roots. Um, but that was three decades ago. So what has happened in this time? Um, <clears throat> is it going to be, are there gonna be more churches that house bats? Are there going to be fewer churches? But one thing that we'd really like to do is to drill down a bit further and look at why. Uh, why do some churches house bats and not others? And we're gonna be looking at a few different factors here. So I've mentioned age. Age, we think, age of church is going to be, we, um, we believe, quite a major factor. But also we'll look at things like the surrounding landscape, um, potential disruption, how often is the, um, the church used and by how many people? Um, are there external lights and how often are they on? Um, and also building materials. And one thing that we can do actually when we're, um, if we get enough churches surveyed, um, we can drill down into regional trends as well, um, which will be really, um, really exciting. Um, and by doing this, we will um, be able to find information that helps both the conservation of bats, but also provides better information and better advice for those caring for church buildings. One other thing that we're really wanting to look at is the perspectives of those caring for churches. Um, and we are um, also carrying out a questionnaire, very similar to the one that was um, sent around to churches in the 1990s. And we want to see whether perspectives around bats have changed at all in, um, in the 30 years since these questionnaires were last sent out. Um, is there more positivity towards bats? Um, and also this will help us um, focus in on the future, um, future, um, future activities and resources, et cetera, that we can provide for those caring for churches to help support them and um, to help them support them with, with um, their bat roosts. So to do this, we're, we're running two different surveys um, and they can both be carried out by anyone. So you don't need to have experience of um, or prior knowledge of bat surveys. Um, so everyone can get involved. And the first is the National Bats in Churches study. Now this is a random sample of a thousand churches across England. And this survey, we ask that you borrow equipment from us, that you visit the church, you take some photos, uh, you look around the main church interior to look for evidence of bats. And by evidence of bats, that primarily means bat droppings and evidence of bat urine. Um, and carry out a questionnaire with your church contacts. Um, if you are a church warden or you're on the PCC, this might be a really easy, really easy thing to do. <laughs> um, but then we'll also ask that you um, put out a bat detector and this will be our bat detector, um, place it in the chancel for a couple of nights and send it back to us. And we also ask that you collect any bat droppings you find for DNA analysis. And through the calls, through the um, bat detector and any um, recordings we find, um, and through the DNA analysis of the droppings, we'll be able to share with you um, the species of bat that are using the church, if indeed um, bats are using the church. The second survey that we're doing is church bat detectives. Uh, so if there's, no, um, if there's no national bats and churches study sites near you, 
you can still help us um, with Church Back to Texas. And this is um, and this is for all other churches in England that are um, Church of England or Churches Conservation Trust. Um, and again, it's exactly the same. It's a daytime visit to the church to look for evidence of bats um, and the questionnaire. And the important thing here is that you don't have to book equipment. It is just um, looking out for bat evidence. And it's quite important actually to say here that we're really interested um, whether there's bat evidence or not. So if you're, if you're interested in surveying your local church, but you don't think that there will be evidence of bats, please do still include it because that's still an important record for us. And I'm just going to play a small um, video now of of what we um, of what you'd be doing. Right. She says, "Hopefully, I'll play it." <laughs> There are 16,000 C of E churches across England and inside these churches are nooks and crannies perfect for bats to roost in. Churches are hugely important for bat conservation. A majority of our UK bat species use churches and they can do throughout the year. All of our 17 breeding species of bat are protected here in the UK following huge declines over the last century. Churches themselves are also incredibly valuable as places of worship, but also as pieces of history. We have to work together to help both the conservation of our natural and our built heritage. We know that bats can make good use of churches, but we don't really know how important churches are on a national scale for our bats. But you can help us find out and bridge this knowledge gap. So these surveys will help us explore questions like how many churches have bat roosts in the summer? What are the factors that affect bats' use of churches? And importantly, what are the perspectives of the people that are living with bats in their churches? Those people that are cleaning up uh, the droppings that they leave behind. To take part, you simply need to register, select a church of your choosing, and arrange to visit once over the summer to look for evidence of bats, and also to go through a questionnaire with your church contact. Everyone is welcome to take part, so don't worry if you've never worked with bats before. We'll show you how to find those telltale clues that bats are using the church. All you need is enthusiasm and to be understanding of the church perspective. By joining our team, you'll contribute to meaningful research that will create guidance for the conservation of bats and also allow us to better support churches. I will say if it, it does become quite addictive, actually, you end up um, every time I go in a church now, I have to look for evidence of bats. Um, so the surveys, these surveys have been going on since 2019. So that was the pilot year. Um, it has been quite a crazy few years, hasn't it? So um, things ha haven't gone quite the way we expected. Um, but despite this, we have got records for 349 churches. And this year, we'd really like to make this up to 500 churches by the end of summer. Um, so of the churches that we've surveyed so far, around 60% of these um, churches had evidence of bats. And you can explore the results on our website. So it's batsandchurches.bats.org.uk. And there you can explore, you can um, filter the different um, different church locations that we've surveyed on the map and you can filter by church age as well, which is quite interesting. And um, as we were speaking, as I was mentioning before, that we think age will be quite um, an important factor. And when you do filter to show the churches that have been surveyed that are from that um, early medieval and medieval period, um, there is, there's more churches that have evidence of bats. Um, and with the surveys so far, um, one thing that 
I don't know if it will be quite surprising for you, but we have 17 breeding species of bats here in the UK. And through these surveys, we've recorded at least 12 species of bats using churches. So a lot of our bat species will use church buildings. The most frequently recorded bats in these surveys um, have been our common pipistrels, brown long-eared bats and soprano pipistrels. Um, so the most frequently recorded by far actually. So our common and soprano pipistrels, they're our most numerous bat species. They often use buildings. And they're the bats that you're most likely to see in your garden. They come out at dusk, um, and they're absolutely tiny. So they weigh about the same as a 20p coin. So really, really small. Um, the brown long-eared bat, we tend to think of these as the kind of poster boys of um, the bat world in the UK. So their large ears do make them look very sweet, but um, those large ears are really important. Um, their hearing is very sensitive. They're even thought to be able to hear insects walking on leaves and that's how they um, forage for their food. They glean insects from foliage. Um, and because their hearing is so sensitive, their echolocation calls are quieter than many other bat species. And it gives them the nickname, the whispering bat. One thing that we have found, um, and this is through the National Bats and Churches study. So the ones where we have the um, the identification of which bats use in the church. One thing that we are finding is that when bats are using churches, that we're often finding that there's multiple species present. So last year, for example, um, 22 churches, we found um, two species of bat present. And that's compared to um, just 13 churches where only one species was found. Um, I do find this quite impressive that there were six churches where um, five species of bats were found in these one-off surveys. Um, so that's quite an interesting um, interesting thing that we're, we're finding. But I'm actually going to go now to looking um, how to look for evidence of bats and what we're really asking you to, to do. Now, Churches can provide great roosting opportunities for bats throughout the year. Um, in the winter, for example, churches can provide kind of cool and damp space, spaces that the bats will need for hibernation. And an example of this, um, sorry, it's not the best photo ever, is it? But it's an example of um, log holes, old scaffolding holes, which are in the tower. And this is an example of a really good um, area for hibernating bats. At this time of the year, however, um, they need something a bit different. So from April, um, pregnant females will gather together and form maternity colonies. And in these groups, the females will give birth to a single pup in June. Um, the pups can't regulate their own body temperature. Um, so the roosts need to be warm and they need to be dry. And areas such as, for example, um, the South Isle, um, the southern areas that are nice and warm can be particularly ideal. And by and large at this time, the males aren't really needed, so they tend to either roost by themselves or in small bachelor groups. But the size of these maternity colonies can vary considerably, and the picture that you see here is of brown long-eared bats. Um, as I say, the, the numbers um, in the maternity um, roosts can can vary considerably even within species, but um, brown long-eared uh, maternity colonies tend to be reasonably small, um, say approximately, uh, well, around about um, 20 individuals is quite common for brown long-eared bats, but that's not the case with all species. So um, just to give an example, a church that we work with closely, Tattershall Church, uh, is home to around six to 700 soprano pipistrels in the summer and a couple of hundred Dorbenton's bats. So that's a lot of bats. <laughs> um, and that is why we really focus these surveys in the summer. Um, if a church is home to a maternity colony, large numbers of bats, um, you're more likely to see evidence of bats if they are using the church. 
And often it's when there's more concerns over um, bats using the church, more concerns over cleaning, for example, or damage to any of the, um, the monuments or fixtures and fittings in the church as well. I was just going to do this because I thought it's it um, nice and fun, but I don't know if anybody can spot the um, spot the bat pop. And yes, bat, young bats are called bat pops, which is um, which I think is quite sweet. But I don't know if you can see here in the top um, near the top left hand side that small pink pop. Okay, so as you heard in that video, um, that, that churches can make um, fantastic roosting locations for bats. So it's not surprising, I suppose, that we find so many of our um, churches house bats. And um, this example, I think is Holm Hale Church in Norfolk. And you can see that the roof structure gives lots of um, features gaps and cracks and crevices for bats to be able to roost in, which is quite similar to a mature woodland. And this particular roost, this particular church is home to um, a colony of Natteris bats. So this maternity colony of Natteris bats, they roost between the ridge, rafters and boarding of this roof. And you can kind of see uh, discoloration to some of, uh, some of that woodwork. And that's actually the, um, the bat urine that's caused that discoloration. Um, I'll just show you um, what a Natteris bat looks like. But Natteris bats um, are one of, so Natteris bats often use church buildings. Um, and we do know that some of our churches are of international importance um, for Natteris bats. Um, oh. Now, in terms of where to find evidence of bats, um, you often find bat evidence um, where there is um, basically underneath their roosting locations or access points. And this example is a chancel arch. So there's often um, where the um, roof of the nave meets the chancel, there's often a gap. Um, I'm not sure it's, um, I'm not sure how clearly you can see this there, but where the wood meets the stone, there's um, often a gap, and that's perfect for the pipistrelles, brown long ears, um, and natteris bats. And um, if you're eagle eyed, you might be able to see um, some black dots underneath, um, and their black dro uh, bat droppings underneath the roost. And other examples of features that um, may be used by bats. Um, to the left, you've got this vertical timber post. Again, you can see that there is um, a gap between um, the wooden post and where it meets the wall. And this could be used by bats. So if you see something like this, it's worth having a look on the wall. If other droppings clung to the wall, um, are there droppings below it? Other uh, things like these uh, timber joints can be really good for um, small numbers of bats as well. Again, if you see <coughs> any, um, any features like this, it's worth looking um, underneath or below um, to see if there's any evidence, um, any bat droppings. Now, there's lots of different ways bats can get into churches. Um, you saw in that initial video that I showed the bats getting in via a missing pane of stained glass. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that we often see bats entering churches or leaving churches um, is actually the gap over the door. And this example is from Tattershaw. Um, it's, ooh, she says, if it, oh, there you go. It's a video taken by one of the ecologists that we work closely with, Barry Collins. And we do find that this is quite a common access point. So it's always worth checking around, um, around the door. Now, our surveys, <coughs> 
focus exclusively really on the church interior. We don't want anyone trying to access the belfry or any voids, um, roof voids, etc. Um, please do be safe. But I wanted to mention it because it's worth being aware that bats may use um, other parts of the building. So if you do one of these surveys and you don't find any evidence of bats, it doesn't necessarily mean that bats don't use the church. Um, this is one of, I think this is Great Totten Church in Essex, um, but this was taken by two um, amazing bat workers, Roger and Sylvia Jiggins. And they've done a lot of work in um, Essex churches. And one thing that they found is that where bat, where roof voids, um, where there are roof voids in churches, that the majority that they have visited have had bats using them. Um, often, often though, because there is that ceiling separating where the bats are and the people using the church, there doesn't, it's not usually, um, there's never usually any, um, any kind of conflict there at all. Um, in fact, most people don't even know that the bats are using the church. Um, and of course, there are also external um, external areas that are, that are utilized by bats as well, things like um, gaps underneath roofing tiles. Now, we will provide any equipment that you need for these surveys. Um, you don't need um, very much to be able to take uh, to uh, carry out these surveys yourself. Saying that though, um, if you do have a pair of binoculars and a torch, it can be helpful. It's not it's not 100% necessary, but it is useful. Um, and I should say, if you do, you're unlikely to actually see bats, um, but if you do, please don't shine a torch directly at them. Um, the reason why I say that it can sometimes be useful, obviously churches are big buildings um, and sometimes it's quite useful to be able to um, have a have a look at the walls um, and often um, it can be quite quite a way up can't it. So this is an example, it's another church in Norfolk, I can't remember the, the name of this, this church, um, but you can see again a gap between the wood and the stone. And this is where um, the bats have been roosting. And you can see underneath, um, it's peppered with bat droppings. Now, this is really what the bat droppings look, look like. Um, they are um, about one centimeter in length. Um, they look very similar to mouse droppings, um, but there is a very easy way of being able to tell them apart. And that's the crumble test. So if you see any um, bat droppings on your survey, uh, you would get a tissue or, um, or some gloves and pick one up and rub it between your fingers. If it crumbles easily, it's a bat dropping. So bat droppings are essentially just the exoskeletons of the insects that they've been eating. And I've been speaking about, um, we were, <coughs> I suppose in that, that video I showed at the beginning, I was talking about a church that had quite a lot of bats. Um, and there might be some occasions where you see large accumulations of droppings, but in the reality, um, most of what you'll be finding are small accumulations or scatterings of droppings. So you really do need to, um, <coughs> I suppose you need to get your detective hat on. Um, and the best place, some of the best places to look are, this is an exam example of underneath the curtain. And that can be a great place to look. Also underneath wall hangings and um, behind radiators as well. So when I'm going around a church looking for evidence of bats, I'll try and do it I'll try and do it systematically. Um, so I would look around the door, first of all, as I mentioned, that's quite a, a common place for bats to access the church. And where they access the church, there's often um, there's often a, a accumulation of droppings. I would look <coughs> on the walls. I would do um, a scan of the walls. I'd see if there's any um, 
features, any gaps and cracks and crevices that look like they could be useful for bats, and I'd, I'd look under those. Um, look on the floor. Uh, there will be, I would, particularly around areas that are quite hard to clean. Um, and as I said before, behind radiators and things, you can, um, sometimes bats do use the main interior of the church for flying backwards and forwards, kind of light sampling before they go out in, in the evening. So you can sometimes get a scattering um, across the church and the pews. Um, Window sills are a really good place to look for um, any bat droppings. But saying that, um, please don't use a ladder. Um, please don't put yourself in danger in any way. If there's a window sill that's very easy to, um, to view, then please do look at the window sills and, and cupboards. Now, there's also um, the other thing that we'd be wanting you to look for is potential bat urine. Um, I actually think that looking for bat urine is a little bit hard and I would say that um, if you're quite new to look, looking for evidence of bats, if, <coughs> um, if bats are using the church it's very likely that you'll be able to find um, bat droppings there. But this is also a good thing to look out for as well. And things like ledger stones, like this photo here, can really show up the bat urine. And you can see that um, it's kind of peppered with white, um, white splashes. And that's old dried bat urine. Again, if you're eagle eyed, you might be able to see a few darker circles and that's um, fresher um, splashes of urine. But the ledger stones really do show this up. Um, you, may, you might see something like this. So this is um, on the brass work. So the, the urine is slightly acidic. So it, can, it, does etch, it has the effect of etching the brass like this. As I say, if you're not sure that it's um, bat evidence, you can always um, take a picture, send it in to us, um, and also have a look. Um, if there's bats using the church, you can usually find the droppings as well. And I just wanted to a quick um, <laughs> get everyone involved, do a, a bit of a, a quiz just to see what everyone thinks. So it's a, a little um, a little quiz. Is is that a bat? And um, in the chat, I was just wondering whether you could put in for each of these photos. Do you think that that's bat evidence or not? Do you think bats are using this church? Um, maybe just a yes or no. Lots of yeses. <laughs> so yes, yeah. So you're seeing um, here the um, the marks, the urine marks there. So well done, everyone. Um, the next one is that a bat? <laughs> what does everyone think? Yeah, there's quite a lot of no's there. Um, so you are absolutely correct. It is an evidence of bats. Um, this is damaged. This was um, a photo um, shared by a heritage advisor from Church's Conservation Trust. I think it, I think that this was due, due to humidity, um, but it wasn't caused. It wasn't caused by bats. Is that a bat? Yeah, lots of yeses. Yes, yeah, this was a photo taken by Shirley Thompson in a church in Kent um, and the bats were <coughs> roosting in the porch. Um, and I know you have to kind of squint a little bit, but there are black dots. Uh, <laughs> there, there are, um, you can just about see the droppings um, on the wall. <laughs> okay, is that a bat? So a few answers for no, one yes. This is, 
Yeah, James, James has got it. This one is a little bit difficult because it does look like bat evidence, but actually it's um, wax stains. That was a little bit, that, was, um, that is a difficult one, but um, this, this was actually um, wax stains from the, the candles. Um, there's just a couple more, I promise. Um, is that a bat? Got quite a few yeses. Yeah, that's um, urine staining on the organ pipes. I think this is the last one. Um, what does everyone think? Is it a bat? Is it bat evidence, I should say? Yeah, um, there's a lot, lots of yeses. Um, there is quite a lot of insect debris there as well, but there are, um, there are bat droppings there, um, most definitely. And again, if you are ever in doubt, um, it's worth doing the, the crumble test. And it is actually easy. It's quite difficult from photos, actually. It's, it's easier in person. So um, when you're doing your survey, um, and you don't need to worry about this, um, because we do have survey forms that, that asks you asks you all of this, so you don't need to you don't need to remember. But we will ask you for the time and date of your survey. That's always important. And also, if you can find it out, the date that the church was last cleaned, because that can be quite important. Um, and what we'll ask is if you find any bat evidence, whereabouts in the church you found it, and. Um, <coughs> I think a lot of you will know churches quite well, um, but if you are unsure about um, the, um, the areas of a church, then we do have some, some further information for you and I can put the link in the chat um, in a bit. Uh, we'll ask you the, the type of evidence that you found. So was it droppings? Was it urine? Hopefully um, you don't find a dead bat, but it's, um, there is a possibility. Um, and we'll ask if you can to take a photo of the evidence and if droppings, how many of them? And don't worry, we're not expecting anyone to sit, sit there and count the number of droppings. That would be crazy, but just a rough, a rough idea. One to 10, um, 11 to 100, over 100, but it's just, it's um, a rough idea really. And if you're taking part in our National Bats and Churches study, where, you're, um, where you have equipment from us, we'll also um, ask you to collect those droppings for DNA analysis as well. So I think that's, um, that's mostly what I think you need to know about the surveys. Hopefully I haven't scared you too much. And anyone that um, hasn't already registered please do um, have a look at our survey portal. So it's batsandchurches.bats.org.uk and there's the option to sign, um, uh, the option to join the survey here. Um, I, I can actually, if anybody wants to know um, how to, uh, wants a bit more information about joining the surveys and selecting your chosen church, I'll actually put another link in the chat for you because there's um, a video um, that talks you through that process. And last but not least, I just wanted to share some of the resources from the Bats and Churches website that you might be interested in. So there's lots of events um, happening. There's um, including some webinars. And so, so we've recorded lots of webinars that we've we've held in the past that you might be quite interested in in some of those um, and our blog posts etc have quite a lot of information about some of the work that's some of the work that's ongoing with the project and um, then I think I'm I'm happy to to take any questions wonderful thank you so much Claire, you made that very, very practical and, uh, and, and clear to follow. So thank you so much. Um, so this is your chance, everyone that's listening, to find the Q&A and pop your questions in there. 
got one question so far. If you are surveying two or three churches, can you use the same equipment or do you have to get three different pieces of equipment? Um, it's a good question. Um, the bat detectors that we send out to you, this is a, a, quite a practical answer here. Um, they have a particular um, code on them, which relates to that particular church. So we would send you out a different bat detector for each church and the same with the vials. So we put um, the particular church codes. So every church, every C of E church has a unique church code. And we will put that unique church code on each of the vials that you collect. And that way we know which vials and which bat detectors from which church. Um, so we would send you out, we could send it out in one parcel if, that, if that's easier, but we would send you out three. Makes three sense. Yeah. And I think that you said, so when people go on to the batsandchurches.bats.org.uk website, and say that they're interested they can look there and, and see if there's a church that needs doing can't they yes most definitely and i've actually put a um, link in the chat now of how to join and select a church and there's over 16,000 um c of e churches so i'm sure that there'll be um, plenty of churches to select near you lovely so there's a question from ellen if you're putting equipment in church for two nights does it have to stay there for the whole period or can you take it away in the day in between the two nights if the church needs to be open during the day yeah um you know you can most definitely do that it's only set to record in the evening so it, it comes on um at quarter past seven in the evening and records until half past six so you're more than welcome to take that away um at the same at the same time um in a lot of churches we have just kept it out and we haven't had any that have been stolen but it is the the project is happy to if that happens it's um we understand there's a risk of that <laughs> um, but, but, but yeah. how big are they are we talking like sort of matchboxy kind of sized i'm just thinking if i have one here to show i do so the ones that we're using are called oh, can't quite see Pier Sonics. Um, so uh, reasonably big. Uh, so the size of a paperback book, I would say that looks like. Yeah, maybe just yeah, a little bit, a little bit smaller than a paperback book if I'm compare the two. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're not they're not too big. But if you are happy to do that, Ellen, um, then you can most definitely just put it out of the way in the in the day. But I wouldn't want you to go to to lots of trouble to um, to go back back and forth to the church if you don't have to. Uh, and next sort of related question: Do I have to go back to the church in between the two nights to remove the detector, or can I leave it in place? So that's the same thing. It can be left. It, it sounds like you, they're almost opposite questions, aren't they? One yeah. saying, "Do I have to get it?" and one saying that they're worried about it. But it's whatever suits them and their circumstances. Yes, yeah, yeah, most definitely. And I know that, so, I mean, it also depends, I suppose, how the church is being used and whether they want a bat detector in the chancel during the day. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yes, either way, what's, what's better for you, uh, for you and um, you could do either. This a, sorry, this is my question rather than one that's from there, but do the bat's behaviour alter depending on whether the church is being used or not by people so is it better to does it matter which day of the week you leave it for the two days um no we uh, we don't we don't think so actually um i can imagine that um it would be best if if there's a an, an evening concert or anything happening at the church please don't leave it in for those nights because all we'll get is recordings of people and we don't want to record people but um no we don't we don't think there is but we will be looking that will be kind of exploring that those kind of questions with this with the records from these surveys so we were interested we're interested in things like how do how does the the numbers of people in the congregation how often the church is used affect bats use of churches 
And we actually don't, we just don't know at the moment. Interestingly, we did a bit of a preliminary um, look at the, the records that we have to date. Um, it, did, it did show that um, bats were found, um, were, well, bats tended to be um, found in church, in more churches with lower numbers, lower um, congregations and used less frequently. But I would not like to, um, I'd not like to put my name to, to that finding yet. I think we need to do a bit more, bit more work because there's a lot, a lot of the time, those same churches could also, it could also be because they are um, rural churches and they're older churches potentially. So and you also, you don't necessarily know which direction the causation is in either. Yeah, yeah. it needs a bit more exploration. A couple more questions about the, the detectors themselves. So one about where do you place the detector? And then the other is saying, can they be used outside? Um, the bat detector for our surveys are, um, <coughs> they'll be placed in the chancel uh, facing towards the nave. Um, so we're asking everyone to put them in roughly the same area of the church. Um, in terms of outside, yes, these particular bat detectors can be used outside. Um, we just, um, for, for us, um, we're particularly focused on um, whether bats are using the internal space of the building, but there's no reason why you can't. Um, these particular ones they're quite um you might need to get something to protect it from the elements i'm not sure how um waterproof they'll be if if it's going to rain but these they're fun they're great detectors they're not too much money um so they can they can they're, they're really they're really quite good in that way although there are lots of other different detectors on the market but for your research having them outside wouldn't help with the project because you wouldn't find out whether the bats were using the church. Exactly, yeah, because I mean, <coughs> I say the, um, if you are outside of the church, you can um, pick up bats that are maybe using external features on the church, which we're not um, focusing on, or also um, foraging around the churchyard as well. Um, so we are very much focused on that. Um, we're very much focused on the interior and the, serve, and the project is completely focused on reducing any wildlife, human wildlife conflict of bats using church buildings. Uh, right, uh, more practical questions. And it's, we've got more questions than minutes. So we'll have to try and uh, answer oh, yeah. as quickly as we can. Um, do we order our equipment now for a date in say July or August or do we wait until nearer the time? You can order as soon as you um, as soon as you have a survey date. Great. Uh, if it's known by the church contact that that's a resident in, for example, the tower, and it's totally safe to access the tower, do we survey there as well or not? Um, if it's if it's um, not too much trouble and you're not putting yourself in any danger please do include the tower. Um, just avoid going up to the belfry or doing anything that is dangerous. Uh, there's a question that says, can you send us a link to the results of the study so far, please? Um, I've put those in the chat, but they're quite a long way back because of all of the yeses and nos. Uh, but when I send around the slides with the links, then it'll be in there again, Charlotte, so you'll get it that way. Um, will you be sent directly sending us the result of this year's study in due course? Okay, so if somebody registers to be part of yeah. it, will they then be on your mailing list to find out the results? Most definitely, yes. The results from um, their church, if you're taking part in the National Bats and Churches study, so we'd give you the, the information about the species ID, and we'd also share the results of when we do the, the final analyses, we'll definitely share those with you. Now, Tony's asked a very interesting question. Is there anything we can do to encourage bats into our church if none are found? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> um, Tony, that's a, <clears throat> I've never had that question before. 
Um, you know what? A lot, uh, maybe this is actually, um, I can give my email address because this is going to be potentially a, a longer answer. Um, and it really depends on your particular church. And um, I feel like it would be quite nice to, to discuss it and to discuss your particular church, the surroundings, and, um, and we can work together to, to do that. Do you want to put your yeah. email yeah. in the chat to Tony, or otherwise, if you're if there's a one for the project, I could send it round with the slides to um, everybody. I, I don't want to send your email personal in the to chat everybody. to everybody. Um, okay. You're more than welcome to get in touch. Uh, how much do you need to involve the church wardens? Um, it's always uh, obviously um, it's important to contact the church wardens and or or the rector um the incumbent or the church wardens or somebody on the pcc just so they're happy that you're you're visiting the church and also to um to carry out the questionnaire because that is really um important they don't have to necessarily be there um while you are carrying out a bat evidence survey um Saying that though, this is, um, I, I didn't put this in the body of the, the webinar, but importantly, uh, for safety reasons, it's useful for there to be two people in the church doing that. So um, if possible, please don't go alone. Or if you are alone, um, please make sure somebody knows that you're there and when to expect you home. Presumably at the very least, they need to know what the white box is that's been left in the church so that they don't. Yes, most definitely, most yeah. definitely. Uh, did you choose churches that are older for the survey so far or was it random that was random um so the national bats and churches study is a, a thousand churches that we um sampled that was a random it's a randomly stratified sample so um it's the age the ages the age structure in our random sample reflects the church heritage record so in the church heritage record, about 50% of um, churches are um, from that kind of medieval period, the old, older churches. So 50% of our random sample um, reflect that. And that allows us to be able to, um, to be able to say something about C of E churches. Yeah. That they're representative. Yeah. All right, and then there are two questions that have actually been popped into the chat. Uh, one is saying our church has a ceiling, an internal ceiling, so there won't be any urine or droppings. Um, is it still worth looking around the building for physical signs? We're certain that we have bats in the churchyard. No, I think most definitely it would be really important to include it. If you don't, there's actually within the questionnaire, um, we ask, does it have a, uh, does your church have a roof void? And it will be very one of the things that we'll be looking at is um is just that really if there's the presence of a roof void are we actually finding that there's fewer church fewer churches than with bat evidence if that makes any sense mm -hmm. um and of course it's it, it's not inconceivable that bats use the main body of the church and the um and a roof void so um, it's definitely worth doing it. Um, and as I say, no uh, records of no bat evidence is just as important for the study as records of bat evidence as well. And then the, the very last is, is, is uh, asking, I think, for a little bit of reassurance. So somebody who's saying they're doing their first survey next Friday, hooray. Well <laughs> um, but the church has voiced some concern that bats, if they found them, would be a pain, extra admin and, and stuff. And what's the reassurance for coping with this if we do find bats? Yes, yeah, so um, all, all I can say there is that um, if the person that you're speaking to um, during, the, during the questionnaire isn't necessarily a big fan of bats, um, just listen, be um, understanding, uh, often just listening can really help in terms of I think there's a lot of worries around what having bats in the church may mean 
but actually um, one of the best things that you can do is um, give them information um, and support where they can uh, give them the information about where they can go um, for help and that might be to the project and I will give you um, and you can um, get a leaflet from the project if you'd like about um, bats in churches to be able to provide to the church um, but also information about um, other support out there and the one that I would really recommend um, giving information about is the free national bat, um, bat helpline and that's a great place to turn um, for any it's a free a free service um, if the church has any um, worries about what that might mean then um, the national um, bat advice service is, is a really good place to go the important thing is that having bats in the um, in the church finding bats in the church doesn't necessarily mean um, any changes to the way that they're using the church at all um, and we would recommend so yeah oh thank you Catherine for putting the National Bat Helpline link in there um, and yeah I think one of the the biggest things is don't feel that you need to solve the church's problems but if you could signpost them to help um, whether that's um, the details of the Bats and Churches project and we can speak with them directly about um, about their situation um, or the National Bat Helpline. Brilliant. Let's bring it to an end there. We're just just clicking past five o'clock. Thank you so much, Claire. For, you just put it very calmly and very clearly so that people know what to do. Um, if you joined today, thank you so much for coming. I do hope you feel inspired to get involved and do a survey of a church near you to see whether there are any evidence of that's there um, and please do come along to our other webinars this week and maybe get involved in churches count on nature this week as well uh, thank you everyone i have saved the chat so i can send you the links and clear slides before i stop for the day and uh, i hope to see you at one of our future webinar topics Brilliant. thank you everyone